Okay, let me get uh, <laughs> all this crazy. All right, uh, VC officer, you on the line? Uh oh, VC off? Ah, no, we're here. Can, we, can you go ahead and start recording, please? Uh, yes, you you have been running for about ten seconds. And you should see the red dot. Uh, no red dot, not yet. Yeah, you're definitely running. So okay. I can see here. All right, thank you. Hey, Mark. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you all for joining us again on uh, what might be uh, second to last one. We might be talking to a champion next week. So. All right. Well, you know, good work there. Twenty-five uh, percent chance of uh, winning a million-dollar prize. Hundred thousand. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's like geez, hundred thousand dollar prize. This turned into video bucks. Jeez, well, now I'm more excited. What are the odds of uh, you? What are the odds of you sharing some of that wealth with us? <laughs> Well, we'll have to see. I mean, yeah, well, you know, maybe uh, you know, you and Mark get a uh, you know moderator, moderator fee. Moderator fee. I know. Okay. Uh, on a serious note, good job there. That was uh, you know, that was an interesting, very exciting episode. Um, Thanks. Let's get started from the from the top. Uh, you come back to the house, and the episode starts with you coming back to the house, and uh, Cheese Target gets uh, nailed to the wall, and we can see this beautiful pattern filled out completely. Is this something that you guys planned? Did the show plan it to have all these targets arranged so beautifully on that? What, what, what I've loved about season four so far, which is different than previous seasons, was you know the, the big target, this wood piece of, you know, huge piece of wood that they, they nailed to the wall. And uh, you know, it's just a very, it was a very nice looking kind of you know, trophy wall, if you will. Uh, in previous seasons, the top shot you know, season one we saw the competitors take a blue shirt or a red shirt, and then they just you know wrote out the person's name on a piece of paper, and then they hung it, hung the shirt on the stairwell. Uh, and seasons two and three, they were just knocking them up. They had the nice wood targets. They looked a little smaller, and then they were just knocking them up on the on some random white wall. And so when we kind of rewind all the way back to episode one, you know, when we came into the house, that was that huge bullseye target on this nice piece of wood, huge piece of wood was one of the first things we saw. And then there's this treasure box off to the side that had all of our targets, uh, the wood targets in them. And we had all talked about, you know, how do we want to knock these up? I mean, it, it looks logical, right? That we just, we went in a clockwise circle. Um, Gabby went in the middle. Gabby had actually asked us if she could Take take the the bullseye target. So when she was eliminated, we uh, gave her that bullseye spot. And then uh, for the final four, you know, amongst us, we said, oh, you know, the three people will be in like a triangle shape sort of pattern. Of, Here's the bullseye, right? And then one, two, three, something like that. And it's I don't know. I guess I'm I'm kind of a sucker for like nostalgia and sort of you know, it's kind of ceremony and. One thing that they haven't showed a lot of on air was after any person got eliminated and you know, we were knocking targets up on the wall, there was usually a, a five to ten second sort of speech by the person who eliminated that person. Um, Kyle actually started that trend when he had eliminated Keith. Um, and so I wish that maybe we'll see a little bit of that in Behind the Bullet uh, or I don't know, maybe on the on, on the DVD, you know, set, but we'll see. Uh, and the last thing to point out about the, the wall, um, apparently we're the first season, I think I mentioned this in an earlier Q&A, that we're the first season that's been asking for, like, shells and, and, and brass as, like, mementos. And so part of what we've been doing, not only to, like, keep that for ourselves, but to, to commemorate eliminated contestants, we would take some spent shells from that elimination challenge and put them up on their target on that wall. So if you watch the episode again, you only saw it for maybe a split second. Um, I actually took a, um, a screenshot of it, screenshot of it, and put it on my Facebook page. Where you can see the wall, you can see some brass or um, uh, you know some other things like I think I like Dylan. Dylan wrote us like a farewell note, so we actually like put his farewell letter, like taped it to his target, so things like that, which is really a nice way to kind of bring closure to people who you know were eliminated from the show. 
It's an interesting uh, angle of a TV show like this because all the other the, the other competitive shows on TV, there's lots of animosity. People leave there. There's a crowd that's very excited that they're leaving. But in this case, it seems like you guys are almost sad that someone got eliminated, which is interesting to me. I don't know if you sort of felt that while you were there, but everyone has to go for someone to win. Right. Yeah. And, you know, for some people, it was a little bit more emotional every time you know we we lost someone because you know remember every episode is three days. One TV episode of 40 minutes is three days in real time. So we're getting to, and we have a lot of downtime in the house um, and also out on the range, like in between, or like waiting for a challenge to start or in between waiting for like the next team back when we were in teams, right? We had to sort of wait for the course to get reset. Uh, so we've got to know each other very well. And when someone gets eliminated, it's, uh, yeah, you know, it, it can be you know, very, very sad, especially for people like Gabby, people like Chi, who were, you know, house favorites, even, you know, and also fan favorites as well. So the 1919, very interesting gun. Oh, that's fun. Part of, part of history. <laughs> what are you thinking when you walk up to the practice round and you see this gun? Did you even actually know what it was? Uh, you know, I mean, when he pulled off the sheet, I mean, I didn't know exactly what it was, but I knew it was a machine gun, and I mean, I definitely got super excited because, you know, I practiced in the BAR challenge, which was, you know, in episode two, but I got like 20 rounds of practice and that was it. Uh, and so obviously in, at the green shirt phase here, everyone has to shoot. So, you know, I was very excited knowing for a fact that I'm going to shoot. The one thing I think to point out that didn't get shown on air was the whole loading process. And so... Uh, our expert, Craig Sama and Sawyer, you know, walked us through all these loading steps. And it's actually really kind of particular. If you don't load the, the first round and seat it properly in, in its right place, the whole thing will jam and you got to pull, uh, pull up the receiver and, and just sort of clear everything out. So the other thing I think how, like, you know, I, I have a feeling they didn't, they didn't show that part because it wasn't relevant to the challenge, but at the time, because we had to practice loading, we had assumed a few things. So we had, we had sort of anticipated that we would be in a moving vehicle or something moving because we already had a machine gun and a stationary um, you know, challenge. Uh, and so we were preparing to have to load in a moving vehicle. So a lot of us were sort of mentally preparing for, for that kind of scenario. But uh, the loading piece was a lot of fun. Uh, and obviously shooting it was, <laughs> was a blast. And you did pretty well. The one thing I noticed on this gun was that, you know, the first shot was, was pretty much spot on and then all the other ones after that were all over the place. Is that something, I, I mean, I'd imagine that machine guns aren't meant to be a precision shooting weapon. It's more to just sort of send a bunch of ranges, uh, shots from a downrange rather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think that's sort of a, a hard sort of paradigm mental shift to make where, you know, I think with a lot of firearms, um, we want to be well. We want to be accurate and hit what we're aiming at. But with the machine gun, yeah, it's it's sort of a to a certain extent a spray and pray mentality. And sometimes, just sort of depending on the use, like in the military. I'm not a military person, but from what I've read and and uh, you know seen in documentaries, sometimes you just need to lay down cover fire. So you're not necessarily trying to hit anything, but you just need to send lead downrange and, and you know give another you know, team an opportunity to move from one location to the other. Um, but in the context of Top Shot, right, we're trying to hit these, and we didn't know they were exploding targets at the time, but we sort of anticipated that as well. Um, but yeah, trying to, you know, Little John, I think, you know, he, he was talking about, hey, this is not a delicate, accurate weapon. You just, you, you need to rip, you need to rip some rounds off and just try and control that muzzle climb. It was an interesting gun because you just had to hold on to the sort of the handle and the trigger and there was nothing else you could do to mm -hmm. really support it. Was that a challenge at all in trying to control the weapon and the muzzle climb at all? Yeah, that was a super interesting part about the weapon system. And so, you know, it didn't, right, we were just holding, uh, there was a handle uh, with the trigger and then you're just supposed to place your left hand on top. And basically, right, this is all sort of the motion um, and, and sort of the leverage that you have to sort of like keep down. Uh, you know, keep the, the weapon down. You know, if it had some kind of butt stock, right, where I could like, you know, really drive your shoulder in, that, that would have helped a lot with control, but 
the the M1919, right? You're just you're just trying to do this, and it's really tough and almost impossible to like, right? Get enough leverage to sort of keep keep the barrel down and, and control the climb. And I think you did pretty well in that training round, and you you said you felt quite good. Uh, were you intimidated by Greg and some of the others who had actually shot this in real life as part of the army or the Marines? Um, a little bit, you know, knowing that Greg and Augie had experience, you know, with automatic weapons, it definitely was playing into my mind. But then on the flip side, knowing that Kyle and Gary did not, um, that 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 actually made me feel better and a little bit more confident that. Uh, you know, maybe I won't get first place or even second place, but maybe I can, uh, you know, at least stay away from not, you know, from from nomination. Then the challenge comes around, and uh, there's this this basically this role of targets, exploding targets, which is always very exciting. Yeah. You didn't know that there was a half track coming along somewhere. So what did you think when you saw the targets and the setup? Did you think you were going to run around? How, how did that play out? <laughs> Yeah, so walking up to the you know to a challenge, right? Like we're, we're we were always talking about oh, okay, well, we're talking about what do we see and what do we think is is going to happen, and uh, we were you know we were anticipating a vehicle because right it was right you just saw this like very straight row right, and then all of the targets are parallel with the road, so we were expecting a vehicle, but you know, we we definitely were not expecting you know a World War II half track that had actually served in the European theater. I mean, that is, like, that right there is, like, what Top Shot is about, to, you know, actually be, you know, a part of history and, and, and shoot these guns and be in these vehicles that, you know, as a civilian, I mean, right, we don't have access to that, that kind of equipment nor, nor set up that kind of experience. So now that you see this big vehicle, you're going to be fairly high up off the ground. Do you have any strategy in mind about how you're going to sort of balance the motion of the truck or the vehicle, rather, the balance and sort of any of the vibrations that come off the road? Um, you know, the road was pretty flat. Um, and, you know, the half track, it's got um, tank tracks essentially on them. And uh, there wasn't a ton of um, vertical, you know, up and down movement, which, which was which was good, but then again, you know, we were screaming down this road at like 25 some miles an hour, and you know, there's just so. I remember there was so much going through my mind. Um, it might have been bumpy. <laughs> you know, I need to watch watch the footage over again and kind of see what kind of you know jolting and vibrations were going on. But I don't remember it being uh, a huge factor, uh, at least like the you know the bumpiness. So you did well in the challenge, and we all know that. So can you take us through a little bit about the actual process itself? So you're, you, this thing is moving. You don't know how fast it's going to go. Um, you did make a comment about the gun being very stiff on the, uh, on the mount. So what was happening all along while you were shooting those targets? I had a moment of panic. <laughs> that that, that I, I think I did a good job of either, you know, either I, I didn't show it or they didn't, or I did show and they just didn't hear it. <laughs> but remember, so we had about a minute we had about a minute before Colby said go, where right, we, we get into the half track and they just they gave us a minute to get used to this gun mounted on this turret. And one of the one of the problems was it wasn't free floating. So it seemed like it was on some sort of like, you know, ball ball pivot. But what was happening is I remember just literally like swiveling it around and just trying to get an understanding of okay, well what's the range of motion? Basically, had, we all had about 90 degrees of, of, of a range of motion, but then within this 90 degree wedge, there were dead spots. So literally, if, 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 if we were standing still and I needed to aim here, I could not get the barrel to point on that spot, just due to the way that the machine gun was, was mounted. And I remember there were a few dead spots, and so the panic was, okay, well, uh, I've got these dead spots where I know I just, it, it, it's not going to, I can't aim in that spot. So if I'm, as we're moving, you know, do I try and you know, remember where these dead spots are in, in a moving vehicle? I mean, just trying to remember this spot in relation to how I'm moving. Um, I, I didn't really like, I, well, the game plan was, well, I need, to, there was a dead spot here, so I needed to basically, I told myself, I need to hit targets as early as possible 
right before the targets pass me and get into like one of these sort of dead zone areas. But um, you saw that there were two cables on the sides, and that was restricting our movement, both for, um, you know, I, th I think mostly for a safety perspective, because if you didn't have those, those wires securing the gun, then we could have swiveled to the front and, you know, right, if we got jolted or something and we have fallen, you know, we, can, we don't want the, the driver to get shot or swing the other way and then, oh no, Colby and everyone, you know, sitting in the back, you know, they don't want, they don't want to, you know, get, uh, get injured. But that added to the difficulty of the challenge for sure. And so the first target, it seemed like you missed a few and then you finally got it. Uh, at what point did you start feeling comfortable with, with your shooting there? The first target, I actually also, I, I had some internal panic moments because I was, I mean, it was a big target. I mean, it, I don't know exactly how big, but it seemed maybe like 20, 24 inches in diameter, and it was close. And I think all of us were glad that they kind of gave a very, gave us all a very close, big first target to um, just, yeah, help us like kind of, you know, build our confidence and start off strong. But I missed, I think I you know, rip two, two, um, uh, you know, two sets of rounds and missed. And then finally, like, as I was trailing, just as the target was about to leave my range, uh, you know, my field of view, uh, you know, I got it. And then I had to quickly, right, swing the gun back to try and, you know, get the, uh, the next target coming up. Um, after that sort of, that second target, there was maybe about two seconds um, before that next set, I think it might have been that first set of four. Um, but so I had about two seconds to sort of write, after hitting that second target, swing back and okay, like I can look a little bit ahead and yeah, sort of anticipate the next, the next target. So when I saw the setup, I thought, you know, the sets of fours and twos would be easy because you, you know, you aim for one of them and the bullets go everywhere anyway. Right. And you might blow them all <laughs> together. But that wasn't happening for anyone. Right. What was going on? Yeah, so the thing to note about I mean, this, this machine gun in particular, I think, I think most machine guns, like, I mean, I don't have a ton of experience, but basically the muzzle climbs up and to the right. So basically the strategy, and so we, actually all of us, we had sort of talked about um, strategy, and this was kind of one neat thing I think about um, the season four cast is, you know, everyone could have kind of kept quiet to themselves and, you know, kind of keep their you know, kind of tips and tricks to themselves. But, you know, all, all of us, we really wanted to help each other perform at our highest levels. And so, you know, like we've talked about in previous Q&As, we want the winner of, of Top Shot to have, you know, competed against the best shooters and to also just know as much as, you know, as, as possible about right how to most efficiently fire or manipulate the weapon, and so the strategy was you want to rip through the top, the, the the bottom left and the upper right, right. So do that diagonal um, that diagonal run there and try and get it in one or two trigger pulls. But remember, every time you, you pull once, the muzzle climb is going to rip up, and then you've got to quickly you know pull pull it back down, and you're moving so it's down and, and over, uh, so if you're lucky to get the diagonal two, then maybe you'll get one more, right? One of the, the top left or the bottom right, if you're lucky, if you have enough time to recover. So that's that muzzle climb, and then just the fact that we're moving so quickly um, is where the difficulty came into play. And then there are the plumes of smoke and the mines going off. Was that a surprise? <laughs> to you that was an awesome surprise. Yeah, we had no idea, right? If you're just looking at that course, you know, before we started, it just looks like, oh, right, there's these exploding targets. We know there's going to be smoke from the exploding targets, but no idea that there were going to be mortars and other stuff uh, flying around. So that was, uh, it was hard to not get caught up in how fun this was. <laughs> And I mean, this is just so incredibly fun. And I remember thinking to myself, I need to remember that this is a competition and I need to be hitting targets and I can't just, just be having fun <laughs> right now. And anyway, you go through the challenge, uh, six shots. You know, if you didn't know anything else about how everyone else had done, six seems like a small number out of 15. How many did you want to get? How did you feel when you went through that round? I was hoping for at least 10 
that was that was the number that I had I had, you know told myself that uh, right with a hundred rounds and uh, fifteen targets I thought ten would be good enough to to you know get me in either first or second place and so uh, when I hit so one thing that I was kind of behind the scenes too is at the end of the run they would back up the half track and we would still be in it. So as we're backing up, all of us, we were counting, you know, how many hits. And, um, and it was so frustrating to see some of these targets where you could see, on the closer ones, you could see the bullet holes in the white cardboard sections of where, I mean, I had one target, I remember, I just must have been like five, four, five, six inches away. It was, you saw it, one here in the bottom left corner and then another round in the upper right hand <laughs> corner. And it was like, wow. And that's right, that's, that's just, the nature of a machine gun challenge. So backing it up, right, we're all counting, and I remember counting six, and, um, and you know, actually then what happens after that, after everyone's run, is the compliance team comes out, and they walk through all the targets, and they're manually checking to see if one of those targets got hit, but did not explode. So I had counted six, but again, I could only, I could either see the explode the, the ones that had exploded, but at a far distance I couldn't tell if maybe right I had hit the orange glass, but it it, it, it hadn't um, exploded. So while I was standing back at uh, sort of where Colby was and watching the compliance, and they're a good like 200 feet away, so I can't really I can't see. I just see them sort of doing you know I see them doing this, just sort of you know tracking their eyes, you know looking for for breaks in the glass. But I was hoping that maybe I could pick up an extra point or two, um, but six, six it was in the end. So six shots in second place, was that, was that relief, surprise, shock, what was that? I was really shocked. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I just, I thought Greg would, uh, you know, he hit eight. eight. Um, you know, he told me when I sat down, because I asked him, how, how many did you hit? And uh, yeah, I was I was expecting at least one of us to to hit at least ten. But then again, right, that was my mentality before actually you know going through going through the run. And I think eight to ten would have been really good. Ten to twelve would have been amazing. I don't think anyone could hit all fifteen targets. Like I think that's just probably close, not impossible, but it just would be extremely difficult to have a perfect run on something like that. So Augie has some experience in the, in the Marines, and he uh, started out and nailed his, uh, the first two targets within the first uh, maybe even uh, three or four rounds. And then he struggled. What happened there? Yeah, so, you know, watching, you know, Augie, uh, you know, he, he got off to such a strong start. And, uh, you know, something that, that, they, that they didn't air uh, was he had a malfunction. At the when he approached the second set of four targets, all of a sudden, from our perspective, the firing stopped, and we're sitting there going, "Like, why isn't he? Why isn't he shooting?" <laughs> um, but then, then we start seeing him reach forward to the charging handle and start, you know, racking, racking the gun. And uh, yeah, poor guy. I mean, the the rules of the game were if you have a malfunction, you have to make a concerted effort to clear it. If it was a, um, a malfunction, like a critical malfunction that couldn't be cleared by the shooter, then they would stop, evaluate sort of what to do, and either, right, maybe they would let you restart the course or maybe give you the number of rounds that you had, and then, right, you would restart sort of at the point where you had a jam. So, yeah, that, that's what happened to Augie. And, um, Really, really tough to watch. I mean, you're right. You don't want to see anyone get 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 hung up on a weapons malfunction, but that that's that that's part of Top Shot. Yeah. Were you, were you kind of happy though? I mean, he, he was the only person who looked like he could displace you off that bench. It was a little tough. I mean, yeah, because if he didn't have that malfunction, I'm I'm pretty confident he would have at least tied me. Um, if not, you know, maybe even beating me and both, you know, Little John. But, you know, I mean, the, this is, you know, the competition, it is what it is. And yeah, like, you have to be, you have to be happy when, 
you're safe. And knowing at that point that I was going into the final four, it's like, right, I mean, for, for this, right, this was day, so in, in this episode, let's see, yeah, so we're still on a, on a three-day cycle, so, right, and we're about, you know, maybe like 2 p.m. on day two. Uh, at that point, just knowing I have the rest of the day off, and then day three, right, just get to, you know, hang out uh, at home at the house until we get to go and you know, watch the elimination challenge. It was it was a huge relief, um, and also kind of a fun moment to reflect. I remember just, you know, coming back to the house and thinking to myself, "Holy, you know, holy crap! I mean, I like made it to the final four, yeah. right?" And after at this point, it was you know almost six weeks of living in the house, and you know not being connected to anyone in the outside world. We've just lived literally in this very weird, surreal bubble. Um, and, you know, it's, it was, you know, and it's been worth it, right? To know that, okay, all of this sacrifice and energy and time um, has been well spent. And even if I don't win, I'm in the final four. I'm gonna be in the, you know, we assumed that season four would sort of keep the same, um, sort of structure where the final four will be the last episode. So I remember thinking to myself, wow, like I'm, I'll be in the final episode of uh, season four. And I was, you know, I was like, wow, like this is, this is very cool. <laughs> so your nomination discussion, you know, there's three people up for nomination and three people are, that, that's all there's left. So there's really no picking except for who gets, who gets to actually make it there. Mm -hmm. And, um, Kyle, for the second time, said something like he's not going to vote for the red team members because they're part of the red team. I don't quite agree with that because you, know, you start out with performance-based voting and now all of a sudden you're voting along team lines. Mm -hmm. But then at the nomination range, he did shoot for a red team member. Do you, do you know anything more about you know, what was going on through his mind? Um, you know, I mean, I, I understand like where he's coming from with you know sort of having this like red team you know loyalty because you know I mean I know you know she had it when he was you know still with us as did Gabby and and Gary um, and Kyle you know he's our team leader and it's just hard even though we're wearing green shirts it's hard to like just sort of brush that aside and you know Kyle he is a career law enforcement officer who has built teams and just understands, you know, team dynamics and loyalty. And, you know, I understand where he's coming from. I, I do also understand, though, how that conflicts with a performance-based, uh, you know, voting approach. Um, so, yeah. The thing I found quite a little on the humorous side is uh, when um, Augie goes up there and says, I'm going to let these two duke it out, figure it out for themselves. That, that was interesting. I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad he did that. Yeah, Augie, he is just, he, he's one of the funniest guys ever. And, yeah, I mean, he, he, uh, he just sort of wanted to mess with everyone just, just for his own entertainment. And, you know, for him, I mean, he didn't care who he went up against. Kyle, Gary, you know, he's a uh, very confident shooter. And, you know, he was saying, yeah, you know, I'll go up against either of you guys, but I want to see some interesting drama. Now that we knew that this whole tiebreaker thing was going to be a shootout, not this silly, you know, draw a name out of a box, you know, it was, uh, yeah, I, I, I also liked how he, you know, did that. That's a good time for Gary to, to figure out how to shoot this pistol at the nomination range. He hits bullseye twice. Right. Hey, we're good for him. So then uh, along comes the uh, nomination practice and uh, for the elimination round practice. And uh, you know, memory and some sort of physical activity going on, plus shooting. Uh, to me, this seems like a show where you're testing your ability to shoot, mm -hmm. not other skills that you've gained through your lifetime. Uh, what's your take on that? I think I, I'm a little bit more on the side of like actually having a little bit more balance between some more like physical exertion during these challenges, because. You know, adding, like, having an elevated heart rate and having to do something else before you shoot, it adds a whole different element to the game. And uh, I think season three swung in an extreme direction where it was a lot more physical activity. Like, you know, they were lugging around, like, a 
150 pound log or something like that as a, as a team exercise. They right, they had to lean it against a tower. They had to climb up this like un uh, this this unsteady um, uh, you know uh, you know tree stump thing, and then shoot. Um, I think in season four, right, we just we haven't seen a ton of physical challenges. We saw right the VAR challenge, right, climbing under the. Uh, the barbed wire, and that was a ton of well, it was a ton of fun for everyone else except for me that didn't get to do it. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I liked seeing an element of a physical element. It was interesting to see Gary's style versus, uh, rather, Kyle's style versus Augie's style in practice, because you see, on the one hand, Kyle, you know, yelling out the patterns in his mind and really making an effort to run around the, the little flag that was at the end to get his heart going, and then Augie's some quiet, so just listens and then does his thing and. It seemed like he struggled a little bit in keeping the pattern in his head, but did okay in the challenge. Yeah, I liked how you, you remember this. The fun part for me is you know, I've never seen, I didn't see their practice, so it was really interesting for me to see. And they didn't. I don't remember them really talking about their their practice. They were telling us about the gun. They were telling us, yeah, there was some sort of memory component, but that and they were shooting. I forget what the distance was, but that's sort of just. That was the information that we got from them. Uh, and yeah, the way that they practiced, I think, really reflects their personalities also, which was, was fun to watch. And Khan seems like the guy who would uh, take his practice very seriously and you know, keep going. Did he do any more memory drills at home with you guys or just by himself? So Gary and I, you know, after they came back from practice, uh, we were sitting out on the deck and we had playing cards which was one of our few outlets, uh, you know, stress relief outlets. We played, on a side note, uh, we played a ton of gin rummy in the house. I had never played gin before coming on a Top Shop, but holy hell, we played so many games of gin rummy, it was ridiculous. I was expecting the house to be a poker house. I'm a no limit or limit, uh, you know, um, you know, a poker player. So, and we had chips, so we had a few games of, of Hold'em, but um, Rummy is just the kind of game that any, you know, it's easy to learn, people can pick it up quickly. And you can just, you just play for hours and hours and hours. So, we had these decks of cards. Gary and I were sitting on the deck, and we'd pull, you know, we'd shuffle and pull five cards, and we'd show them to Kyle. And then he would run around the deck, and then he would, you know, read off, uh, you know, the, the five cards, you know, both the suit and the value. We were getting concerned, though, something, you know, that, that they didn't show either. Of course, they didn't show us doing this, uh, this practice session with Kyle, but we were doing this for a good hour and a half. And I think when you're exercising your brain with, right, sort of like memory challenges and stuff, like, you can tire your brain out. And we were telling, like, hey, you know, Kyle, if you want to take a break, you know, we're happy to stop and we'll, we can do this, like, two hours from now and just sort of pick it up. But he just wanted to keep going. Like, okay, like, you know, you know, you, you know yourself better than we do. But um, I sort of wondered, did he get a little fatigued out um, from this practice session? Because he was just relentless. We were, just set a five after five after five, and just him running around in circles. <laughs> But you know, you know, he he was definitely well prepared. And while this was all happening, Augie was so sort of Augie's go-to uh, sort of routine was laying down on this bench that we had near the barbecue. And he would just lay there, just lay on his back, just sort of stare at the ceiling, quiet, state himself, come up and chat every once in a while if people were were hanging around him. But it was really interesting to see that contrast. And a very interesting elimination round. There's physical activity, but not just running. You're, you know, going across these two poles with, uh, on a rope, and then uh, memorizing ten targets. And there were a bunch of decoys on there as well. Talk, us, talk to us about that. Where were you guys? Were you close enough to see all these things? Did you know what was in that box? So when the when the challenge started, you know, the bench we were at, it was a good thirty feet from the box, and so. We had no idea, me and Greg and Gary, we had no idea what the objects were inside the box. So that was sort of one part of the challenge that we were just like, it, it kind of made it exciting for us because we, 
we, we didn't know what they were sh like what how either of them were doing at the same time it was a little frustrating because right? we, we wanted to know who was ahead or who was behind um, so we didn't get to see the objects beforehand but the second piece is the rack of, of objects that was like 75 80 feet away from us so even if we knew what the objects were some of the things like we, we couldn't even tell if they were getting hit some were obvious like the shaving cream which was Cool. The wall. They need to do more of that. They, they absolutely need to do more like shaving cream type uh, objects because it was awesome to watch even at a distance. And on Tuesday, it was awesome to watch the slow mo of that can just spinning and all the foam coming out. And um, so, but things like the clock, we we couldn't see. I I remember seeing um, or watching, and I'm like, well, if they hit the clock, I. I couldn't really tell. Um, so yeah, you know, it was it, it was a sort of 75 seconds of okay, well, we're just seeing them shoot shoot this this cool cool gun, but we'll have to wait and see what Colby you know announces. You know, when the when the challenge is over, I don't think anybody knew. I don't think Kyle knew, Augie knew, or Colby or any of us knew how any of them did. What do you think of Augie's strategy of memorizing half of the the items and then coming back? It, minute and what, 10 seconds? Not very long. Yeah, I probably would have chosen Kyle's strategy and tried to memorize all 10. Um, I mean, that's me, and obviously I didn't like give it much thought because I didn't have to do it, but I think that would have been my natural inclination to, to just try and memorize these objects. I feel like I was like, pretty good um, um, sort of like you know, spatial you know, memory and such. Uh, but I thought Augie's you know, approach also made a lot of sense, although I thought he spent too much time shooting. Because um, right, he, he literally he got one shot off with literally like a second or two left. Um, and so that was, that was the risk. And, um, and obviously with Kyle, I mean, he, he, he had problems where he just, he just blanked. And that's where adding that physical element, I think, was very cool, right? You, you go across that rope that rope uh, and then plant your feet down and oh okay now you got to revert back to this memory recall state of mind versus right switching gears from the physical to a, a mental state was, was I think really challenging for them. Now you've expressed in the past that Kyle's one of your favorite people on the, mm -hmm. the cast and you looked up to him as a red team leader and as someone who has more experience and someone who helped you out from well. What does it mean for you to see Kyle go home? I was really, really expecting and hoping for him to make it in the final four, and I think they they, they mentioned it a li little bit on air, but he really wanted it bad. I mean, he just he he really wanted to win the whole thing, and he really I mean, but really wanted to make it into the final four, and it was really sad, but. Uh, uh, on the same, you know, on the same token, okay, it's not like he died or anything, right? So, I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, I mean, I will see him in the future. Uh, yes, it's very sad, but, you know, I mean, I am, I, this, the entire competition, I've had a mindset of, you know, I want to win this thing just as bad as the rest of them do, and for that to happen, I'm going to have to knock every single person, you know, out of the way. Um, so I think mentally I had prepared myself. I mean, yeah, before the challenges started, I had prepared myself in case in the event that Kyle, you know, had lost. You know, you sort of, I remember, I don't remember what I said to Kyle when we said goodbye to him, but I think a lot of us, we, 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 we thought ahead of time, right, like, if we want to say anything special, like, what would we want to say to them? Um, yeah. Let's open it up to the crowd. You know, we forgot microphones, which is fine for yeah. for, for this, but uh, maybe for just so we can catch on the recording, maybe we'll, we'll do this. Here we go. Anyone? Oh, there we go. Oh, and let me unmute. Darlene here, we're going to unmute you in case you have any questions. Let's see. Mute audio. Oh, no, you unmuted yourself. Okay, great. So, um... Have you shot any shaving cream cans on your own since then? I uh, no, I haven't. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything cool that I've shot besides 
steel plates and cardboard. No, but I do want to go out into the desert and bring a one of those huge propane tanks and just, yeah, go to town on that thing. I, if you go into YouTube, there's plenty of people <laughs> who've done this, uh, but it's so cool to see, because uh, all the propane will ignite and then you just see just like roaring flame, um, you know, just going like 20, 30 feet in the air. Some people throw propane tanks into like junkyard cars, so they shoot the propane tank inside the car, and then you know the the, the car windows will blow out and everything. And I think that that's that's what I would want to shoot, or like a washer dryer, like a refrigerator that's like abandoned or something like that. Sure. <laughs> so all my questions. Or uh, Darlene, do you have any any questions on the hangout? Don't have to. Hold on. I think you're muted or your microphone might be off or something. There we go. We can hear you now. Did you have a question? Uh-oh. Maybe we can't hear you. <laughs> That's all right. Um, you can put it in the chat window. You can put it in the chat window on the, on the side of the Hangout if you want to type your question in. All right. We'll keep an eye on the, on the chat window. Okay. Do contestants plot to be second just so they can get the $2,000 gift card? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of like elimin elimination. elimination. Yeah. Um, you know, most of us did not. But there definitely were a few who, not necessarily that they wanted the, the gift card, it, w it was more for the, you know, they usually save the coolest stuff for the elimination challenges. And so, like Dylan, right? I mean, Dylan talked a lot about how he wanted to go to elimination uh, to do some cool stuff. Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think a, lot of, a lot of people that were into it for, for, the, for the money, though. So after a practice session for the elimination round, did uh, the competitors have any, uh, well, I guess we answered this, but I guess this question is about some of the, the memory practicing exercises that you guys did at home. So, so we should just skip that. Okay. Oh, so in the episode that Gabby was eliminated, we were convinced that Gabby was likely to win. In the last episode, we were convinced Kyle was likely to win. Was this all just clever editing to keep us Sort of guessing, just the way they filmed it. Um, gosh, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, like all the cast members, we have like zero input into whatever narrative that they decide, or narratives that they, they decide to choose. Um, yeah, but I think you know, to, sort of to the question, I think it has been interesting to see. Yeah, you know, who do they sort of? You know, talk up more, or not talk up, but who who do they show more footage of, or um, sort of what kind of like psych outs do you know do the producers you know uh, kind of like decide to to to, to you know, show all of us? But yeah, I don't know. So the season's been full of very interesting challenges. Which has been your favorite? Huh? Or maybe one that you really wanted to be a part of and you couldn't. Be yeah, I think I got to go back to that grenade launcher elimination challenge in episode two between Kyle and Keith. I mean, that thing was just, it was just mind-blowingly cool to see. I mean, one, it's a grenade launcher for crying out loud, but then the exploding platforms. I mean, the pyro team, they just loaded that thing up with, with so much explosives. It was awesome. Tell us what Colby was really like. Um, yeah, that's a good question. It was, you know, I, I guess, I think just like anything we see on TV, I think we need, I, I had the mentality of anything that I was sort of seeing from Colby, I had to kind of take with a grain of salt because it's not, I guess I just didn't feel like it was real life, right? It's like, because he is a TV host who has like his persona and like his character and 
you know, while we're on set, I don't know to what extent, right, is he really, is this like the real Colby or is just this his persona? Um, and we didn't have enough interaction with him for me to really like glean that. Um, I mean, from the interaction that we did have with him, and this would be, you know, before a challenge would start or if we were waiting for teams to like switch and they were like resetting the course, sometimes he would come over and, uh, and banter with us. From what I gathered, I mean, he's a really nice guy, uh, really easy to talk to. Uh, he does have that southern drawl thing, right, that, that, that he does. Um, and, uh, and his teeth are very, very white. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's, he's a nice guy. I mean, I think he's someone, you know, it would be nice to, you know, have a beer with him or go shooting with him sometime. It seems like, a, you know, he's a very, like, down-to-earth kind of guy. Here's an interesting question from David. In your view, what do the final four really exemplify as a group or even individually? I told that right a bit. David isn't convinced that the winner of Top Shot is the best shooter. Okay. But he does think that the final four are really good. And he wants to know wh at what? I mean, what are they good at? Hmm. That's, kind of, that's a really good question. Um, I think... Yeah, you know, with the final four, I mean, it can vary, right? Because so, you know, some of us, you know, some of us got got to the end through you know good shooting. Some people might say um, you know luck, you know, played a large part into um, you know how far all of us have made it. Others maybe played the, the sort of the political game better than others um, by you know right befriending people and maybe a limit, avoiding nomination. Uh, because of their friendships or stuff like that, uh, I think you know. I, I mean, I can I can speak for myself. I feel like you know my you know my success was based on shooting, and I remember thinking at the very beginning of of Top Shot that you know to a certain extent, yes, like I want I want to and sort of need to make friends and you know it never it just it doesn't hurt right to have allies and friends on either the red team and or the blue team and right who knows right some maybe someone won't nominate me for elimination just because like we're friends but it wasn't something that it wasn't something that I was like investing like a ton of time or uh, energy into so Again, like for myself, like I would like to think that my, my shooting skills have, have made it in this far. I'll say for, for LJ, I think his skills have, you know, also gotten him as far as they have. I mean, even though, yeah, he, he's fallen short in some team challenges. But right, the great thing about Top Shot is there's, with the exception of Gabby, unfortunately, right, there's always usually a redemption, second chance challenge. Uh, where little, little John has like clearly shown that hey, like he can compete. Um, you know, it seems like at this point that his nerves are, you know, finally kind of under control, and uh, you know, he's really he's really shining through uh, as a great shooter. And like we've talked about over the past few weeks, he's a really great guy. Right? This is to a certain extent, this is TV land where we're all these very simple one-dimensional characters when we're not one-dimensional there's much more to us like a lot of Facebook fans you know they actually like they don't like me because like I'm an IT guy and uh, they just like hear this like IT guy computer geek thing and that's the persona that I wanted to carve out for myself because I knew how like just drop dead simple that was for people to uh, to sort of relate to but uh, um, yeah it, we're all much more complex than, than any sort of one-liner one label. Last question out here is about the 1919. Okay. Did, did it give you any sense of what life would be like if you were one of those soldiers who actually used this in real-world combat? Oh, that's a great question. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember when, bef so before my run started, it's, it was raining. And so I, was, I remember sitting, I was or standing, um, waiting for them to tell me to, you know, load into the half track. And all of a sudden, just like, yeah, like, rain started coming down. And I was thinking to myself, this is so cool that 
we're in a World War II vehicle, like simulating like you know a battlefield scenario. It's raining, <laughs> and uh, you know like how how could you like recreate you know something like a, an environment like this? And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, like wow, this is maybe as close as you could get to kind of like simulating what it would be like to have fought in, in World War II or like the Korean War or something, you know, something along those lines. So, um, v very neat challenge. Uh, we were just ecstatic that we, we got to go through, uh, through a challenge like that. Great. Any other questions on the platform? Oh, we've got some questions in the Hangout in the, in the chat window, so we can go to those in a second. All right, so in, if it had been you instead of Augie in the elimination okay. or nomination range, would, and you were definitely going to elimination, would you have shot Kyle's or Gary's target? Oh, interesting question. <laughs> um, I, I would have I would have shot Gary's yeah. target. I mean, I think you know he he had the least amount of targets that that, that got hit. Yeah. And the other lens, I think, there's always this this challenge of okay, do you evaluate your decision based on that specific challenge, or do you look at the overall performance? And I think either. Way I, I think Kyle, you know, up until you know this point, he, he's had more like kind of shining moments. Um, the, I mean, Gary's been, I mean, a great like strong performer. Um, but I remember at the time I was seeing right, Kyle went four for four in the shotgun yeah. challenge. Um, I mean, he struggled in the BAR, but he did really well in the plate challenge. Uh, and yeah, he's just he's just been a really solid solid shooter. Um, both, you know, Gary and um, uh, Kyle, great shooters, but yeah, I would have I shot Gary's target. Yeah, I was shocked when Augie did him. Yeah, <laughs> but it was fun that way. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're going to some hangout questions here. Well, the first question is about what you thought was your favorite challenge, which uh, I think we already answered. Right, yep, the uh, grenade launcher challenge, which was awesome. Since you were so close to Magic Mountain, <laughs> did you did you go out there during your downtime? <laughs> That's an awesome question. Um, so you know we are we're quarantined to the Top Shot house, and uh, you know for we, we just yeah we're not allowed to leave. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't make any trips out out to Magic Mountain. What is Magic Mountain? Oh, so yeah, if, if you don't know what Magic Mountain is, it's uh, so Six Flags is another name for it, but it's an amusement park with roller coaster rides. Um, I grew up in Orange County and went to school in LA, though, so um, I've been to Magic Mountain before. Um, really fun place. Uh, unfortunately, it, it seems to have been taken over by gangs over the past like decade. So, yeah, sort of an unfortunate problem. But I, th I think maybe they're they've gotten that under control. But anyway. Mary Darling's a little disappointed because she, she worked three jobs there. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Maybe she could have uh, given you some, uh, you know, direct access passes or something nice. to help you guys all get out there. I said, well, Darlene, you know, so if there's, a, if there's a season five, you know, maybe we can get the season five, five guys out to Magic Mountain. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for joining us today. And, uh, Good luck with the last episode. Yeah. Thanks. Let me tell you, it's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for making room for coming. Thanks, Darlene. I'll see you. End broadcast. Close. There's a crazy delay here.